Hey there, perfect peeps. Have you ever wanted to come on to a podcast and talk about what you've been working on? Or do you have a product to show off? We would love to have you on perfect.dev. Please reach out. You can find us on codingcat.dev or just reach out to me personally, alex at codingcat.dev. I'm really looking forward to some new stories, uh, whether it's in Flutter, in Vue, in Angular. Come say hello. Don't be afraid. We'd love to have you on. Thanks so much. Welcome back, perfect peeps, to perfect.dev. Today, we're talking all about creating a startup, and I've brought a whole crew with me. So thank you, everyone, for joining. I really appreciate it. Everyone on the, uh, the pod today has either created their own startup, they run a business, uh, they have a podcast. It's an amazing group. So if you have questions, feel free to uh, hit us in the comments, and hopefully throughout, we'll... Uh, We'll show your, show your comment on here and we'll go through it as well. Um, so to introduce yourselves, first up, we have Aaron Frost. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Aaron? Yeah, so um, I created a company called Hero Devs. We, just, we do kind of, it's an expert consulting boutique, mostly around um, JavaScript and Angular. So that's, that's one of the things I also... Uh, a long time ago, back probably around when I met Tyler, started a conference called NGConf. And uh, so I run a, a big Angular conference as well. So, And never, I have a podcast never called heard The Angular Show. So uh, also doing podcasts as well. So, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, great podcast. Check that out if you haven't. Um, next up, we have Allie. Hey, I'm Allie. I... I'm probably a little different from other people on here that I do have a day job. So I'm a senior developer advocate at uh, AWS Amplify, but I also have a couple of side gigs. So I have my uh, company, which is We Learn Code, and I do, or I used to do mostly, um, education, developer education consulting through it and content creation. And then I also have the Ladybug podcast with Kelly, which is also its own business. Mm. Yeah, that's very cool. We get to hang out a little bit on AWS uh, Community Builder, so it's it's been fun seeing you over there. I, I hope you're still excited. What are you, three months in now? I'm like uh, six months in. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Time flies. Yeah. Cool. Next up, we have Kelly. Hi, I am Kelly Vaughn. I'm the founder and CEO of The Tap Room, first and foremost, the Shopify Plus agency. Uh, I also co-host the Ladybug podcast. And I also co-host another podcast called uh, Commerce Tea, which is a podcast to help you succeed on Shopify. And I also wrote a book called Start Freelancing Today. So I have I, I collect LLCs for a living. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'm super excited to uh, kind of talk through your book a little more. more hope, hopefully we can get to that. How many sure. domain names do you own, Kelly? It sounds like you probably own a lot of domains. So here's the thing. I think I own maybe like 17 total. I don't okay. own a huge amount, and most of them are like variations of my company name. Okay. Nice. Gotcha. I own a ridiculous amount, and it's always in like the hope of a, I'm going to create something, <laughs> and then it never pans out. I get the message from Google. Um, it's expiring soon. What do you want to do? I'm like, uh, Remember the side knowledge? project you wanted to do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And last but not least, we have Tyler. Maybe least on this panel, I'll, I'll oh. take least. That's I'm fine with that. Um, not at all. Tyler McGinnis, uh, founder of UI.dev, uh, where we do mostly uh, education around uh, a lot in the React ecosystem, uh, and then we have some JavaScript stuff as well. Um, I uh, created the Udacity React Nano degree back in the day. Um, run a few newsletters. That's about it. So. Yeah, I think you got your big start, like you did a React course, right? And it just blew up massively and you were able to yeah, spin that, that was, out, right? Yeah, that was uh, 2014, 2015. So wow. Yeah. It's been a minute. Been following so. you for a long time then, haven't I? Thank you. Cool. Tyler's been a great teacher ever since I met him. Like he, he was responsible for kind of blowing up the local tech scene with our boot camps. He was like the teacher extraordinaire that everyone claimed was the dude that taught him everything. So, and now he does ui.dev, which if you don't subscribe, go subscribe. Because Atta boy. It's probably, Atta boy Frosty. It's probably, <laughs> it's probably the best newsletter in tech today. Seriously. Thank go you. Read it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. That's very cool. 
Yeah, you all do amazing work in the the web development area. That's why I really wanted to have you on. And I don't know how I I managed to get you all on a single podcast, especially with what a week and a half, two weeks notice. But uh, thank you once again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, Above me here, I also have Brittany Postma. Um, She is my partner in crime on Coding Cat Dev and probably the primary reason... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the primary reason that we are uh, having this discussion, um, I went from my simple LLC that I basically do nothing with, um, and we are going to grow out Coding Cat this year. And it's like, how do we do this partnership thing? How do we start a yeah. business for real? How do we do accounting? And like all these questions, and we've been stressing about for months now, and it's like uh, lawyer talk and, and all that. And everything it. we're going to be going through, I feel like a lot of web developers struggle through this, like starting out. What do you do? What's the right way? So I'm really I, excited. How do I take my biz, my dev hat off and become a business owner? Like yeah. doing that, doing that switch is difficult. <laughs> Yeah. Because exactly. I still have my dev hat on, which is why when I refer to myself as CEO, it's actually chief everything officer. <laughs> yes. <It> still includes <laughs> developing. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I guess with that said, uh, I have a list of questions, but we're also looking for some some viewers' questions if you have any, um, and we'll we'll just keep going through this, and hopefully I can learn a lot, and Brittany can you know she already knows a lot, so she she helps me. Every <laughs> I can away. learn from everything. <laughs> so I, I think one of the one of the biggest questions that we always go through, and we talked about for a minute, like Allie's back into a full time job. How do you leave that full time job? that comfort that uh, benefits the salary like all that fun and finally break out on your own does that anyone have a good story about how they did that all right i'll go um i didn't have a traditional corporate job before this i so i went straight through from undergrad to grad school i have a very different educational background i've got two master's degrees in public health and clinical social work so totally related to development (laughs) and i wanted to work at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. And so I applied for a fellowship there. And it turns out that I was the only applicant for the fellowship because they needed somebody who had their master's in public health who also knew how to code. Like, well, this is perfect. This was made for me. Um, So that was my first, like, only real job of sorts uh, before going out on my own. And I was still freelancing at the time. And I was actually making more money freelancing than I was making through that fellowship program. And the only reason why I was sticking around there was for the health insurance. So Um, I ended up, uh, I I ended up, I married my husband in September of that year. We just happened to get married. Um, And I was able to get on his health health insurance, which is what what really officially made the switch for for me to be able to go full-time freelance. And I hate that it was all based on health insurance, but it was. Uh, That's one of the big open-ended things. Like it's hard to get health insurance, especially outside of an employer. So that's one of the questions that people come up with all the time. It's like, what do I do? Now, did did any of you just start out straight off freelancing full-time? I I know Kelly, even in your book, I thought you talked about like at a 14 year old you were freelancing right yeah i had my first project uh, my first client project when i was 14 years old i taught myself how to code when i was 11 i had my first client at 14 it was a family friend who actually yes back in michigan it was it was a an interesting uh kind of journey I took because now I specialize in e-commerce. That was actually an e-commerce site I built just prior to the transactional functionality being available at the time. So Mm -hmm. kind of interesting that that all that kind of came to play. Um, My payment was a t-shirt. Don't recommend doing that, especially when the (laughs) t-shirt was in my dad's size. It didn't even fit me. Um, But I do still have the shirt. It's missing a sleeve. It's been used as a dust rag for years, but I am eventually going to frame it. So it's like my first dollar of sorts. Um, I just need to find it again because I already lost it. I always love seeing those photo frames of the first dollar. So your photo mm-hmm. frame of the t-shirts is pretty sweet. Yeah, it'll be so fun. I'll just put it back there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like when I hear that story, that kind of blows my mind. Like if someone said to me, hey, do you remember when we were 14 and we were responsible and we did consulting gigs? I'd be like, <laughs> no, I was Not an idiot. <laughs> I don't remember anything besides idiocy before 25. So, <laughs> so yeah. 
So I'm not I, I really like, sure how I figured it out, to be honest. I, somehow I somehow I managed. Um, I was definitely very much a child. I have to imagine, like, looking back on it, what my friends thought of what I was doing, because that's a really weird thing for a 14-year-old to be doing. So, I mean, maybe the joke is there that I didn't have many friends. I don't know. Um, but, you know, it happened. Okay. That was my history. Yeah, and here I am today. Yeah, so, like, I remember mowing lawns and always wanting to own my own business, but it's it's super scary to like step out on your own and be responsible so to this day i still have a day job great paying day job i love it but i've always wanted to own my own company and you know we want to we want to do this thing so i'm curious maybe tyler you can you can talk about um kind of how ui dev stemmed from this this need or this want to like teach and all of a sudden you have this this business right yeah it's a kind of a weird story. Um, so as Frosty mentioned earlier, I used to teach at a company called Dead Mountain, uh, which was like a coding boot camp here in Utah. That was 2014, maybe. Um, got involved with the Egghead folks, um, who are fantastic. So started doing like, they were really my uh, onboarding into teaching online because I'd done obviously a lot of in-person stuff. Um, at the time they were doing, and it's still kind of this way, um, their thing is like bite-sized videos, right? Um, and they've since uh, ventured into the world of like doing like Ken Dodds has a full like production thing with them. Uh, but at the time they didn't have that. And so I was used to very long form teaching because I was doing like lectures at the boot camp. Um, and Egghead just didn't fit that style. So really uh, started doing my own thing on the side. Uh, that very quickly replaced my salary for the startup I was with. And that's when, to answer your earlier question, um, I made the switch. And it was a, it, it's hard for me to like give that advice because obviously like it's, pretty rare where like this your business is just making more than like your uh, nine to five and it makes it very easy to, to, to make that switch um, that's kind of how I got involved with it is um, you just love teaching and uh, luckily was able to make money from it um, and then from there uh, stumbled a few times as far as like branding goes but we've uh, we eventually landed on UI.dev and that's where we're at today so yeah oh, very cool um, so on the flip side of that, uh, Ali, you, you were kind of like into the, the kind of freelancing side of the world and, um, have since started up at AWS. Do you feel like that's a step back for you or it's just like an additional part of that journey? I, I know like you even commented, I, I'm really tight on time these days because of the AWS side. Yeah. Um, I actually never was full time on okay. doing content or anything like that. I, did though have my company as my main form of income just because my other job I was teaching at a boot camp, which sounds like other people have done as well. It's not not necessarily paying the same as a developer job by any means. And so um, as that grew, it was a larger source of income, but I still did have that day job with insurance and all that. So I'm really lucky that I uh, Age-wise, due to Obamacare, I could have stayed on my parents' insurance the whole time, too. So that nice. that's lucky. But yeah, I, I actually haven't been full-time. So I And the big decision for me has been mostly just on trying to establish my credibility. And so working for different companies in order to do that, at least for the next couple of years. So that's my big decision. Very cool. No, it's it's a hard decision to to go either side of it. So I really appreciate you being on for that other voice to it too. Um, I was gonna. So our our next kind of question, and it relates to Brittany and I, um, and how we're we're forming this. Um, have any of you dealt with a partner? And Frosty, I I know I'm, I'm gonna jump to you first on this because I know you have. Um, uh, how do you how do you start that partnership? How do you make everybody happy? How are you breaking down percentages? Like, can you talk through that? Yeah, I think um, I think this is a difficult question to answer because every situation is going to be different. Yeah, mm -hmm. I will say the first time I did a business that mattered, um, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't. I accidentally started a business. Can I say that? Is like that's the <laughs> thing, right? So absolutely, we realized afterwards. Oh this is going to be way more successful than we thought. But by that time, I, we had already committed ownership to who and who and who. And unfortunately, over time, ownership, the, the responsiveness of the team, there was five of us, did not match. And mm -hmm. there was clearly others outpacing. Certain people were outpacing the rest. And 
there was a total lack of focus on the business from others. So in that first business, I learned a lot of really important lessons around how to structure my next businesses. And so now when I bring on partners, I will give equity, but I, I give everyone vesting. And because a lot of times, I mean, all of us who have done something is like, hey, let's all get excited and we're going to do something. And then this isn't a criticism on on anyone. This is just how it happens. And it's, it's, it's not a fault of humans. About 95% of people will disappear. Right. So it's not because they're bad or you're bad or it just it wasn't a good idea. It's just life, you know. And so I don't like to give equity to someone who's going to walk away. So I, I try and protect the business more and say, hey, we're all going to be in and we're all going to vest over time. None of us get anything just for being here today, but we can vest. And I, I, I just explain how vesting cycles work and everything. But that, so I'm, I'm a lot more protective of the business now because I did make a accidentally I made I made I was successful and in that made some mistakes on that first time so yeah do you get funding up front for things like that I've never gotten funding um I'm okay. trying to get funding right now I'm trying to do like Gatsby but for Angular or next it's really next Jazz but for Angular and we're trying to, we're, we've got it we're just trying to get funding right now so I've never gotten funding I think everyone needs to start doing that yeah next JS in every world yeah. Is this is this outside of uh, Scully? Something else? It, it's Scully. Okay. So there's a there's a free version and there's a a, a Vercel like platform that it could run on too. So yeah. Cool. Uh, very cool. Yeah. Um. So yeah, you talk a lot about vesting, and one of the discussions that Brittany and I often have are, you know, I had this thing going, and it wasn't very far along, and I put, a, I'll say, ridiculous amount of money, but it's just. I lose tons of money trying to teach others how to code and just putting videos out and my time and stuff like that. But then Brittany raised her hand and said, Hey, I want to be part of that. So it's like, okay, cool. Let's have a discussion of what that looks like. And it's, it's hard for us all the time to be like, Hey, Hey, Brittany, can you work on the site? And she's like, yes. But like, I feel bad. Cause I'm like, I don't want to like steal time or money away without something being in there. And so I really like that discussion around vesting um, and like how you break that down. Um, can we expand upon that? Has anyone else ever dealt with that yet? Anyone else have partnerships going? So we actually formed Ladybug Podcast as a partnership and then oh. later switched it to me being sole owner of it. Oh, okay. Um, it's just, it's from a tax standpoint, it's significantly easier to have one single owner of it. And then uh, the co-hosts are all paid as contractors. So I just issue a 10 and I handle, I handle the business side of things for, for the podcast. So I just, you know, I do all the bookkeeping. I do all the year end taxes and make sure everyone gets their 1099. And it's just it's significantly easier. So Kelly, um, you you were you were literally uh, like a your entity was like a partnership. Then you switched it to an LLC. Is that what you're right. saying? Yeah. Got it. Yeah, which uh, I it was. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm really happy we made this decision. It's it's so much easier for the, for the for all of the hosts as well uh, to let you know one person handle all the the business side of things. Um, for the tap room, I am 100 owner of it. Um, but this year, I'm actually starting profit sharing for the team, so I'm still hanging on to all the equity of it. But this is still a way that I can give uh, give to the team and reward them as we continue to grow. Um, so I'm using guideline for our, our 401k and they've got comparability profit sharing built into that. So I'm excited to, to get that going this year. What type of partnership did you have on the Ladybug podcast originally? That's a good question. <laughs> like, I wonder because there's so many different things like an LLC can be labeled as a partnership. It can be like a corporation just based on oh, how you want yeah. to be taxed and like how so, did it, you go into it? For Ladybug, it was just LLC set up as a, as a partnership. Okay. Um, my gotcha. my personal business, Kelly Von LLC and the Taproom are both S Corp. So LLC tax is an S Corp. Okay. So how did how did you go about that decision? That's something that we keep going back and forth on. Um, we, we've actually made it almost to the finish line uh, through Stripe on on their Atlas program. And it was like, wait a minute, if we ever get sued, we got to now fly to Delaware because they're in Delaware. <laughs> and like all of those questions start coming up. And I realize like you guys probably aren't like tax accountants or but you've been through this. And so there has to be some thought in there. Right. How did that sure. all break down? 
Yeah. So thankfully, uh, I live in the state of Georgia. Georgia has really easy business registration. Uh, just like the process, it's like $50 a year to renew. It's only like $100 to set up an LLC. So significantly cheaper than a lot of other states. So that was easy for me in the first place. But in terms of deciding whether to go LLC or S Corp, uh, the really important thing about remembering uh, if you're going to go as the S Corp is you are, a, you are an employee of your own company, which means you have to run payroll for yourself as well. So so you have to be bringing in some amount of money to be able to do that. The benefit of going the S corp route versus just going LLC is that you pay you don't pay the self employment taxes on what you pay yourself. Uh, you're only you're only paying basically half the half the self employment taxes. So depending on what your revenue is, it could be extremely lucrative to go the S corp route. It does involve more tax forms. Uh, you get to that schedule K one at the end of the year. I know I'm speaking very much in American tax code terms, but that's all I know. Yeah, we, uh, we, we did actually. I'll I'll throw it up here. We got a. Are you all American, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we are all American. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so yeah. I mean, that's why I decided for for the tap room definitely makes sense to have an S corp for that. I have uh, nine full time employees uh, as well as myself, and for Kelly Vaughn LLC, I went the S corp route just based on the 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 money I was bringing in uh, through the S corp. That's what I was going to say. Is you have to probably have enough money coming in to pay that reasonable salary that you need for the S corp. And that's a really important piece to it is that re what is a reasonable salary? Because the yeah. IRS does require you to pay yourself what is considered a reasonable salary for whatever your job is. Um, so I cannot pay myself $10 a year and take the rest of the distributions, unfortunately. Yeah. So I have a real life salary and then distributions on top of that. Yeah. And so I guess I'll throw this out there too. Like these are all things that <laughs> have, uh, I've been talking about for like months now. And at the end of the day, we just want to get back to the, the parts that you you all do great. If you ask me, it's the teaching part, right? We, we want to get Coding Cat back over to Next.js, get the new site up. But we're also like thinking long-term, what happens if it is successful? Like how do we actually position ourselves? So I love talking through like the S-carp and pieces like that. What did did any of you when you were forming like your initial LLCs, did you all just pay that fifty dollar piece and you're like, cool, I have an LLC and I'm good? Or was it I need to go to a lawyer or uh online or how did that kind of work for everybody else? I'll start with uh Tyler. Yeah, I can actually sadly uh can talk a lot about this because we put a lot of thought into it. Um so we're I don't know if anyone else it probably doesn't make sense for anyone else to be a Delaware C Corp. We're actually a Delaware C Corp. Um there were some reasons for that, mostly around like if you're wanting to raise capital um, and you're wanting to do like the whole you know growth startup game. Yep. Um, most most uh, investors are going to want you to be a Delaware C Corp just because that's what they work with all day every day. Um, also, if you're issuing like equity and you have like um, essentially shareholders, there's some limitations around doing that with like an LLC and like an S corp. Um, so essentially, like if you uh, if you want to raise money or you ha you have employees who, where you're issuing like equity on like a vesting schedule, you probably want to go with a C-Corp. Um, any other situation, you probably don't want to go with a C-Corp because there's a lot of like tax disadvantages to doing it. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, but there are some uh, that we don't need to get into. Um, I don't even remember what the initial question was, to be honest, because uh, like my head's in like C-Corp Delaware yeah. land right now. Uh, but that's what we did. So initially, <laughs> before we were branded, we used to be like an like Kelly, uh, an LLC filing as an S-Corp. Um, with the rebrand, we switched to a, a Delaware C-Corp, and that's what we are today. So so you switched from the LLC to the C-Corp. Yeah, that's an not, important not, thing. Not technically. So technically, it's a brand new entity. So we didn't actually, um, like the old one, I'm in the oh, process okay. of just you like dissolved. letting die. Exactly. Yep. And so um, this is just a brand new entity. So like UI.dev, the like Delaware entity was formed like in like January of 2020. Oh. Okay. And the other one was formed in like 2014 or something. So it's worth noting, it's a lot easier to dissolve an existing entity and then set up a new one than it is to uh, change an entity type. Because yes. depending on the change that you're making, you might need to go through the process to get a new EIN, which is the uh, the, the tax identification yes. number for your company. Yep. Uh, so it's, it's a whole process. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely recommend uh, talking to a, a an accountant about that one. Yeah. And so for, that, for, that, was, for, that was kind of the initial part of the question too. And Tyler, maybe this is where we're leading. Um, how did you go about that? Did you go sit down with a lawyer and actually work through this? Did you use something mm -hmm. online? What did that look like for you? 
Yeah. So no, didn't talk to a lawyer, but you should definitely talk to a lawyer. Uh, that's, that's the, don't follow, don't follow what I do. Just follow what I say. Um, no. So we did a ton of research on it. Um, and the conclusion we came, came to was like, we want to do a Delaware C Corp. Um, most of the time you're just going to want a generic, uh, LLC, right. And I say generic, not like an integrating way, just like a normal LLC. Cause that's what most companies can you like for coding cat. That's what I would do. We use Stripe Atlas to set it up. It was fantastic. Um, they have LLC options as well. Super simple. I think we paid like 500 bucks for the, uh, for them to handle everything. And then we do like a t- Delaware, um, uh, I forget the exact name of it, but we pay a fee to Delaware every year. Um, so anyway, that's, I, I would recommend Stripe Atlas. It's fantastic for, especially if you're just like, Hey, I have this like side income and it sounds like, um, a lot of the other panelists did this as well, where they have side income all of a sudden it's like, Hey, people are telling me I should have like a, an official business to run this money through. Um, Stripe Atlas with an LLC is probably your best bet. So, awesome. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Even like the response, me saying, "Wait, we're gonna put the brakes on." Like they were super responsive throughout that whole thing. So, mm-hmm. um, it's it's really exciting to hear that side of it. Um, okay, so kind of starting like let's let's pretend we actually got this thing rolling. Now we need to uh, start getting work in. And actually, let me see, Chris Ellis, through where do you find clients? Um, so. I also want to hear like, where do you find clients, but not just that, like, how do you pitch them work? So we always call it like a statement of work at work or kind of uh, that initial, it's not even an invoice, but just what you want to offer to a client. How do you present that to them? Anyone? Aaron, Aaron, you're shaking your head around. So that's, that's, it's an interesting question. Everyone's going to do it differently. Um, (laughs) The, the, the easy, the simple recipe is try it out a few times, fail and fix your process. Uh, bad salesmen don't go in with a script. It's okay to go in with a script your first few times, but you need to have a script after a few, after, after your first few times of failing and stubbing your toe, each stub of your toe needs to become part of your script next time. Whether that's having a slide deck or something else, like just figure out how to not be a dev in the sales meeting and how to become a de- uh, become a salesman. One, <clears throat> this was really weird. This was a really weird thing for me for that in that phone call where I'm selling. I always told people, I'm not a salesman, I'm a developer. But when I was 19, I went and I did this, this church thing for a few years. And I didn't realize the church was teaching me to be a salesman. I thought I was doing something else, right? <laughs> like I didn't realize I was selling God to people. But then I hired a professional salesman. Be like, hey, dude, this is how you sell. This is how you close. This is how you progress through the funnel. I was like, wait a minute. I did this for years, yo. Like, and so I realized, wait, um, th- everything I had learned, the fundamentals of salesmanship, I learned when I was 19. And that made it go oh, so much smoother. It made me go, oh, I have been a salesman before. It made the transition easier. Not everyone was brainwashed into a cult when they were 19 and like went and like sold something that they... Uh, you know, but so I kind of got lucky in that weird part of life. But anyway, um, I just was, you just have to hone your craft, stub your toe. Don't be that unprepared salesman that, that doesn't get a script. You eventually got to go in with your scripts and your props and your talking points, but it's okay to go in your first time with no idea what you're about to say and no idea about what they're about to ask, but you just got to hone it. And it's kind of like a, a rough stone rolling. Eventually you got to smooth off those edges, you know? I think that and I think doing a lot of research, like before you go in about the person or the company that you're going towards, just make sure that you know what they're about, what's important to them and not just focus on what you're selling, I think is really beneficial. The the other thing I'll just add is it was difficult for me to not see what I was when I went into sales mode. It was difficult for me to not feel like I was bragging. Because it's like, well, I, yeah. actually, my team is the best at the thing I'm about to go sell you. But when I would say I'm the best, that was, I felt like I was bragging. So I would talk around, you know, we're pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if there's people that can do what we can do. But then I realized that sounds, that's in a sales call, that's weak. In, a, in If I was yeah. giving a talk at a conference, that would sound horrible. I'm the best. Like that doesn't come across well in a, in a, in a, in a tech in scene but in a sales call that is how you have to talk like this is the best team that you're going to get you know we consult for google we consult for the biggest clients like you that's kind of how you have to talk it's totally different than how you would sell something during a code review like it's a Absolutely. completely different hat 
Find something that you can help them with, benefit, um, make them more money, like find something that you personally or your company can help them with and sell them that. Say, hey, we can get you 15% more revenue or whatever it is. Just find something and let them know that. Be confident. I will say, be careful with giving actual numbers unless you oh, can yeah. stand by those. <laughs> Uh, yeah. That's a very, very slippery slope to go down. Um, in terms of research ahead of time, so this kind of goes both ways. It's good to know about the company who you will be speaking with or the people you will be speaking with, what their roles are, what the company does. Um, again, I focus on e-commerce, so I have a very specific kind of uh, niche that I'm that I'm in. I know what I what I'm getting myself into, but it's also important for them to do the research on you as well. So we have a new project application that we send to everybody. Uh, if they want to get on a call with us, we require this project application to be filled out first. It's a little lengthy. We're asking, you know, what is your your USP? We're asking, of course, what your needs are and things like that. But our, our goal is like, I'm, I'm actually looking, how much detail are you putting into this? If you're just answering just like, NA, we'll discuss on call, <laughs> you're not putting the effort into the relationship up front. I'm not going to do the same thing going forward. I understand that's kind of coming from a point of privilege of already having a number of clients. Not so easy to do when you're just starting out. Um, but understand that these sales calls go both ways as well. They have to be a good fit for you and you have to be a good fit for them. If you start signing on clients just to bring in the money, just to you know get the portfolio work, and they end up being terrible to work with, not only are you taking up your time for clients who you would actually enjoy working with, but you're just going to go mad. You are mm -hmm. going to just not enjoy the work that you do. So it's very, very important that you take these sales calls to be as much of a review for you as it is for them as well. So yeah. kind of like a job interview, the same thing. You're interviewing the company as much as they're interviewing you. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with what Kelly just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I also, I say this, that every job that I've ever had, I got by doing the job for free first. And <laughs> this was no exception to that, where I was creating content and putting it out there for free for so long before I ever even thought about making money off of it and was just doing it mostly for myself. And then people started reaching out, asking me to create content for their companies. And so it was kind of a natural transition from there, but most of them were doing the outreach to me rather than the other way around, which is a lucky place to be in. But I think there's a lot of truth to that for a lot of people that they're at some capacity doing what they were that what they want to do for their company, but on an unofficial basis first. And then what I did was I made a work with me page. So I had a page about all the information that somebody would need to know if they were going to do a collaboration with me, what my rates were, what timelines would be, how much time to expect things by, just so that everything was really upfront. Um, all the stats on my following and how many people read my content normally and things like that. So that Everything was done upfront. Expectations were set. I was not jumping on a call unless I knew that they were serious and that they were actually going to pay what I was asking them to. Um, I, I think wasting my time on a lot of those calls, especially while having a day job, would have been really exhausting and really overwhelming. And so making sure that they were serious first is really important because, again, this relationship goes both ways. So you actually talked about something that I want to break down into a little further. Like you put out um, kind of your rate and and what the actual work was that you get into. I want to talk about maybe some of the tools too. Did you use anything to actually get, you know, once, once you have a client kind of, yep, I, I want to sign up, I want to do this thing. Did you have an actual like statement of work that is, it has to be signed off on before you started anything? And if so, like, what tools did you use to actually go through that process? That's a great question. Somebody else might have a better answer, but most cool. of the companies that I worked with had their own. And so did that and then like uh, invoicing through QuickBooks or whatever. Okay. So does anyone else have a good, good story as far as like the statement of work side of this? So, yeah, I'm similar to Allie. Um, sometimes a client will have a statement of work and that's the easiest negotiation because yeah. I just have to make sure there's nothing crazy in there. Right. But uh, a lot of clients won't have that. This is maybe one of their first or second times working with a consultant. So 
in that scenario, I do have my own. I worked with a lawyer. You're going to want to get a lawyer that's familiar with business law and this in where you, wherever you set your jurisdiction. Usually along with a scope of a statement of work, you're going to have some sort of a master service agreement that defines your mm -hmm. relationship with the client. And so the MSA and the SOW get pretty important. And you can be a Delaware company, but you can also say, hey, if we have any arbitration, that our jurisdiction area is mine is Salt Lake City. Um, oh. So like you can you can move your jurisdiction elsewhere for like an, arbi an arbitration. But that doesn't move your tax code somewhere else. That just that just moves your jurisdiction. So there's all sorts of stuff that you can set up in your MSA. I don't. I just went to a lawyer and said, "Hey, here's one that my friend uses. I need something similar that works in Utah. Like, let's make this work." And then the lawyer. I think I was. I think I was fifteen hundred bucks in by the time I had my documents. But they're documents that I feel comfortable with now. And it and it describes, hey, you know, if I write anything open source while I work for you. That still belongs to the open source, but oh. anything in, in your code base belongs in your code base, and and I don't have any right to it. Like so, it really very well describes what's about to happen. So so yeah. Cool. Ab, does anyone really use LegalZoom? Sorry, no. I was just gonna mention it's it's absolutely important to to use an attorney when drafting up any kind of legal document. It is well worth the cost. I've I've had attorneys draft up um, our our statement of work, which has gone through multiple editions at this point. Um, our employee handbook. Um, they review any kind of NDA that's that's given to us. We are very very careful about signing NDAs because we don't want to limit ourselves to be able being able to work. Let's say in, in like I'll occasionally get an NDA that says I can't work in let's say I can't sign on another another home goods company for five years. Like, are you kidding me? First off, side note, I am not a lawyer, but NDAs are very difficult to enforce. Uh, second, non competes are very difficult to enforce. Um, Almost but, impossible. Yeah, but. Still, make sure you have an attorney involved in that. I actually, if somebody sends me a, an NDA to sign, I, I tell them it's going to cost you $500 to have my attorney review this. Do you really want to sign this? And wow. suddenly an NDA is suddenly not so important. Or occasionally wow. I'll get paid $500 to send it over to my, my attorney and I pay him like 200 bucks. So, how oh, did, nice. <laughs> how, how did you go about finding like the right attorney that would fit your needs? Um, so we've gone through quite a few iterations. I had one call me, great guy. My my friend's an actual uh, family lawyer out in New York and he, he had some suggestions and threw some names. I talked to him, they were okay. I didn't love their attitude, most of them. Um, they're probably more New York style, which makes sense. Uh, a Midwestern guy, I need some like huggy, huggy feely type thing. <laughs> um, so we, we sat down with uh, another one. She was great. She said, I work off a fixed price for LLC work, 750 bucks is like, awesome. That That's great. But I also need uh, I, like the... Uh, a business mindset. Yeah, exactly. And I, I want to know like tax stuff. And sh she set us up with a tax person. And then um, what's the word I'm looking for? The stuff you put on your site for uh, privacy policy, terms okay. of service. I said, you know, I want those things too. And if since like Tyler, you could probably talk a little bit more to this, but uh, learners on the site, my biggest fear on the coding cat, like learning experience, the LMS side of it is someone goes, oh, I didn't know I subscribed for 10 years. I want my $10,000 or whatever number it is back. And I don't want to get sued for that and say like, nope, sorry. Like I want all that clearly defined and out there. Um, so I don't know. This is just my ramblings, I guess, but I'm just curious, like how did you, did you go about like setting all of that up nicely before you like turn the switch on and say, okay, the site's live. Like we're, we're okay now. Maybe yeah, I think, you could. Yeah. Yeah. I think what's interesting is like, there's, I'm, uh, I think everyone on here is like dealing with uh, really big clients and doing like consulting type stuff. I don't do any of that. So as far as like, like when I said I didn't talk to a lawyer, it's because Stripe Atlas, like they hand, like they do all of that. But yeah, when you're doing like contracts and everything, like you should, uh, just to paraphrase, or just to like put an asterisk on what I said earlier, you should definitely talk to a lawyer, as Kelly mentioned. Uh, as far as what you're saying, um, it's never been an issue with us. Like somehow, it's, uh, I've been, we've had subscriptions for probably like two or three years now. And I think um, maybe less than like 10 times, someone's like, oh, I didn't realize this was a subscription. And in those cases, like it's just easier to just give refunds. 
luckily, like uh, the business is healthy, and I would rather you come back. And like, I don't know how many times it's happened. Of those ten, probably at least like two or three will come back later on once we release a new course. Um, and it's like a good PR thing. Like, I'm I'm not trying to take your money unless you're giving it to me. And so it's a it's a I wouldn't be super concerned about it as long as you're upfront. As long as when they sign up, it mentions there's a, it's like a subscription. Like you can make the UI pretty clear about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if for whatever reason it wasn't clear enough to that person, we always just issue refunds, and it's no big deal. They they really appreciate it because they're not expecting to get a refund because everybody else who does subscriptions is kind of evil. Whenever you're like get outside of like the de- developer community, right? Like we've all been there yep. where uh, you try to like you don't realize you have a scrip- subscription, yada yada. Um, so we just say like in our FAQ, it works like Netflix. You can cancel any time, and then if for whatever for whatever reason like you forgot it was on, then we just give you a refund, and it's not a big deal. So yeah, my my wife's a Disney fanatic, so I'm always like, yep, just make your clients happy. If totally, your users yep. are happy. Totally worth a refund. Here you go. So totally. you don't yep. want to end up on Built for Mars. I don't know if y'all have seen that site, mm. but it's pretty awesome. Bad user experience stuff. <laughs> totally, <laughs> for sure. Um, so, okay. So now we've, we've kind of walked through how to get a client. Um, I still don't have a clear picture on how I want to do my SOWs, but whatever, we'll figure that out. But now we're kind of into that, that range. Um, and I guess I should have broke down the Tyler, you kind of just touched on it. Like we will have coding cat and it's going to be a learning platform that we have, but we're also planning, which Aaron touched on open sourcing the core platform of it as our, hopefully, I don't know if it's the first or not. I keep, I keep saying it's going to be the best uh, next JS LMS that will be out there. And so we're putting out black cat LMS as a open source project. So anyone can start up their own LMS sites. So that's another piece to it. And those are kind of our, our two funding models is, we're going to have the, the learning platform part of it. But then if others want to come uh, to us to have their website updated with this new LMS package, Black Hat LMS, that's kind of the service side of it, too. So we, we have those two flavors going into it. And I'm just curious, like, as we start building that out, how do we do accounting? Like, what software are you guys using? Is it just QuickBooks and it's that simple or how does that look? I can uh, just give you kind of our stack real quick. So we have, uh, we use Gusto for payroll and HR. They're fantastic. Uh, Mercury is our bank. They're like an online uh, first bank. It's like if uh, any one of us were to have created a bank, like very UI UX focused, very pretty, very nice. Um, They've been fantastic. Um, Bench we use for bookkeeping. Um, So they handle all of our bookkeeping. They're nice too, kind of like an online first uh, bookkeeping. Earth class mail is really nice. I don't know if anyone else here uses that, um, but basically, like, I don't like getting letters uh, in the mail, like physical letters, and yeah. so they handle all of our like. Basically, we have a place in Salt Lake with like a, a physical address, so we send all our mail there. They scan it for us, and then they send basically send it to us in an email. So that's, that's fantastic. Sweet. Yeah, super super nice. Um, and that's kind of our uh, our tech stack. I wouldn't worry, and and two, I think. A lot of times, and this is probably true for everybody on this panel, it's very easy to get caught up in like the oh, I like, do we need gusto for this? Like, do we need like payroll and like all of these things? Like, I would worry about getting your first ten customers, and then kind of figure it out after that. Like, yes, you want to have a solid foundation as far as like bookkeeping and accounting and all of those things go, but like it's it's very easy to get into the mindset of you can't get customers until those things are set, and then you just never get customers because um, uh, you're so focused on like the, the primitives of the business, right? I would have the opposite approach where like uh, money can solve your problems later on. Um, and so I would optimize for getting customers and making money before I worry about any of the like entity, Delaware, whatever stuff. So anyway. Very yeah, cool. I, I definitely have to echo that, especially the last part being that we we tend to focus so much, especially as developers, we tend to focus on our tooling before we actually have a product. And we can spend forever trying to figure out what, what we use. I have changed our tooling, our, our stack so many times. And, you know, <laughs> I went from when I started freelancing to running the tap room. So definitely a lot of crossover with Tyler. We use Gusto for our payroll and HR. I cannot say enough great things about them. Um, they just helped me navigate getting health insurance for my team as well. So really, really happy with them. Wow. Uh, we use FreshBooks for our accounting or for, for invoicing. Um, our CPA does our bookkeeping. I did use Bench originally. 
it's way easier to have my CPA do everything all in one place, especially when you have multiple businesses, because she has literally everything when it comes to my life. Um, we use guideline uh, for our 401k. Um, what else do we do? So we, we've tried multiple CRMs. Um, I am now back to using, actually, I'm using Notion now for our CRM because we use Notion for all of our internal notes for our projects and for meetings and everything. It's so easy to just kind of transition somebody from, you know, going through the, the, the lead gen flow over to an actual project and have everything on there. So it's really handy. Um, we just switched over to using Harvest for time tracking as well, if that's, nece if that's a, a necessary thing for you. Really excited about that move. We were using FreshBooks time tracking before, but okay. uh, we get more details with Harvest. Um, we use Panadoc for, uh, for our statement of work as well, for sending out the statement cool. of work and quote. Um, we yeah, were cool. using Proposify before. Both are fine. I think we just landed on, on Panadoc because they offered me a really good deal. So I like saving I might money. have to ping them some more then. I'm looking for a better deal. <laughs> yeah, definitely do that. So, so that's one of the things I often recommend as well is ask for discounts. Worst case scenario, they say no. Um, this chair that I just recently bought, 15% off because I run a business. It's wow. it's a Herman Miller chair. So 15% off a Herman Miller chair is a lot of money. <laughs> Huge. If you're from West Michigan, that is important to know your your office furniture chair. That's right. It's so fun. I, I'm originally from Michigan. Um, I live in Atlanta now. But every time I get on the phone with somebody from Herm, Herman Miller, like going through the sales process, it's like talking to my family. <laughs> That's right. Just like have like a very distinct way of speaking. So I love it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we flip-flopped. I'm from Georgia. So... <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. No, that's a that's a great bra breakdown of your stack. I, I really like that. Um, and it's it's actually all tools that we've looked into. Um, the the next piece that I'm I'm somewhat curious about. So I have a full time day job. I don't see ending that for at least six to ten years. Um, and I want to I want to ship stuff. And so Brittany's been awesome enough to kind of come on and say, you know, let's do this partnership thing. But how do you go past that? Like. How do you offer people work without having so many clients in the door yet and being able to really pay them anything? Is Have have any of you run into that where you're like, please come up with me on this journey. I, I promise you will make money at some point. I come from a different standpoint just because uh, I'm in the services game. I take on work as, as work comes in. Um, starting with contractors is the best way that you can go. Yeah. Uh, so there's no, there's, you, you don't have to pay somebody because they're not on payroll. If you don't have the work, you don't have to, you don't have to pay them for work they're not doing. Yeah. Um, ease into hiring employees. Don't jump the gun. Make sure you can cover payroll for a certain number of months, preferably at least three or six months before you, you make your next hire. Um, but yeah, starting with starting with freelancers is, uh, is a really great place to be. We still work with contractors regularly because yeah. I think we have, um, like I said, we have nine full-time employees. Uh, four of those are developers and we have, I think, like four or five contractors that we, we lean yeah. on as well. And how, how do you find contractors that you know you can trust or authors? I think, Tyler, you have guest authors. Aaron? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm thankful to have uh, this large following on Twitter to have some such amazing talent out there. Uh, so, you know, we, we have a very specific interview process, both for full-time developers and for our uh our, our contractors as well. Um, speaking to multiple people on the team, we're looking at their work, we're looking at the, we do a pairing exercise, especially with the, the full-time employees um, to see not only how they work, but their thought process and and just kind of like how they mesh with another another developer on the team. Um, that kind of allows for everybody to kind of get to know each other. We're very like, well, it sounds like we have this very strict process. We're very like, <laughs> I my, my last developer hire, I actually made the job offer to her literally during our interview. Oh, wow. So it's 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 something that you need to be very intentional about when it comes to hiring. Um, it, and that kind of completely goes against the advice where I'm about to say hire slow and fire fast. <laughs> um, you have to make very intentional hiring decisions. I just happened to know that I was absolutely ready to hire this developer before even going into the interview. That's really she had cool. Sold, I had been so sold on the experience just from everybody else she has spoken with on the team. Yeah, I'm, I'm scared to death to like hire someone on full time and let them down. Not even like that person could be great, but if I can't pay them all of a sudden somehow, I'm like, I gotta go 1099 for a while before I can feel that comfort. Yeah. Um, Aaron, do you have, you have people you employ, right? How, how did that look for you getting started? Um, 
the starting was scary. I my product shifted a lot. I was offering all levels of development consulting and the lower end I was making less money and it took 10 times more maintenance. So I I switched what I my entire business to be well, we only do experts now cuz I don't want to babysit my consultants. I need I want to hire the best cuz and I want to charge like that. So you make more money, my employees are happier, my clients are happier and I have way less overhead. It's kind of like this why would I have ever not done this first? And so, um, and once you get there, you can start to do Kelly's, uh, I fall, what Kelly said, that's what I did. So, I mean, my advice is what Kelly said. I started small, started with contractors. And then once my business transitioned and once we figured out what we were, then we, we made some more money and we, we started going to W2s and stuff when, when it made sense. We still, we still use contractors when it doesn't like, I'm I'm exactly what Kelly said is exactly where I'm still at today. Awesome. And, and 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 to Kelly's point, I'm still like CEO as well. I still chief everything this thing, and it's it's frustrating. I'm about to make a transition to where uh, I don't consult anymore. But for now, I am Kelly. Kelly sounds like her and I are doing a lot of the same stuff, though she's probably at a completely different scale as far as like awesomeness. And, um, <laughs> Certainly, I'm like I feel like I'm. I looks like I'm twice her age. So that she's doing it is ins- I, it's such super impressive. So yeah, well, you have to remember she started when she was 14. I know. <laughs> I, <laughs> I've, had some, I've had some some time to figure some things out, and I'm I'm yeah. making it as I go as well. Um, <laughs> it's it's important to have mentors in the space who have uh, who are you know a few steps ahead of me, um, who I've been modeling my company over after as well. And it's really great to learn somebody else's mistakes so you don't make the same mistakes. And yeah. I've definitely made my fair share of mistakes. I've made terrible hiring decisions, and you know it's it's all it's all part of this whole journey. And and that's this is part of entrepreneurship. You are going to make mistakes. Get ready to fail and just be comfortable with making those mistakes. As long as you learn from them, they're not mistakes, they're growth. They're learning opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope I hope you all listen to How I Built This with Guy Raz because I feel like I've learned more off that podcast uh, in my entire life just from people's failures all the time. So I'm constantly learning this stuff. Um, I do want to just ask this question. I know I didn't put it in our notes, but... I, I, we're also trying to do this podcast thing. How the heck do you go about getting sponsors or should I even care about sponsorship? I will start this one because I handle our sponsorships. Um, don't focus on sponsors until you have content created. Okay. Um, you need to, you have to prove your worth. You have to prove that you have an audience. You have to prove that your your sponsors are actually going to get some kind of return on their investment. The reality is sponsorships for podcasts are a completely different space than like a an ad on a website or a commercial. Um, There's a because it's so audio based, you're not going to get the same level of return on investment. You're not going to get the same level of tracking. Also, podcast analytics are absolutely terrible. Just <laughs> there's no there's no sense of actually who you or like how many listeners you have. Um, I've, you know, I've got two podcasts. So there, there are definitely a different skills in terms of uh, who we're bringing on as sponsors. But, you know, we built up this audience. We, we built up very intentionally. Um, we've grown Ladybug to allow us to bring on more and more sponsors. It increased our rates over time. Uh, for Commerce Tea, we kind of started backwards uh, where thankfully we had already kind of established ourselves in the space uh, for e-commerce in particular. So when we announced that we were starting a podcast, people actually reached out to us saying, hey, we're interested in sponsoring. And I'm like, let's figure out what we're doing and then we'll get back to you. Nice. So yeah. I think we actually ended up doing the same thing with Ladybug. When we announced Ladybug, people had also been like, let me sponsor you. And we definitely said, pause for just Hold a second. Up. Yeah, <laughs> That's a nice place to be in. But I think both you and Allie have a huge following on social media. So how, how do you get there how do you grow do you use tooling to like push out your content to your social media platforms how do you grow no i just post shitty developer tweets (laughs) yeah Yeah, there's (laughs) alley no no uh very much agree with that where it's being yourself and people are following a whole person so you got to show the other sides to you as well not just your content but then 
uh, providing quality stuff that's not salesy to them and building those relationships up so that people then share it. That is really the best way to go. Um, when I started out, I just wasn't in the habit of posting on social media. I had like less than a hundred Twitter followers and, you know, it just wasn't part of my day-to-day -day routine. And so at that point I put it on my checklist every day to tweet like three times. And so on my to-do list every single day it showed up. And so that's how I got in the habit of doing it. But uh, a lot of it is really just connecting with people and making those relationships because those relationships are what matters. Having a bunch of followers that you paid for or whatever, like those aren't going to convert to anything. You want to have those real relationships that you're fostering and growing because those are the people that are going to be your ride or dies. They're going to stick up for you. They're going to um, share your stuff. They're going to connect you with people in the future. So, And then you get to start podcasts with them and become really good friends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, your DM group chat becomes your podcast co-host. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, that authenticity is, is absolutely important. And it's really important when it comes to social media to recognize that it is not a, it's not a one-way communication. You have to be com like replying to people who are responding to your tweets. You have to be engaging with others on theirs. And I don't want to turn it into like this game. Like, it, it, I mean, social media, well, I have a lot of opinions about social media, but <laughs> this is just where I am now. Um, it's just... Be as as Ali said, be your whole self. People know people can notice when you're not being authentic, and they they know when you're trying to sell a certain image of yourself that's not truly you. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, if you've been following me in the past year, you've noticed that I'm really noisy when it comes to politics. <laughs> um, a lot of people were like, "I followed you for developer tweets, not for political tweets." I'm like, "Here I am. Unfollow <laughs> me if you don't want it." But this is this is who I am. Nice. Um, so we're probably probably starting to get to the end here, but one one last question I'd love to ask all of you, and I, I think you've you've talked a bit about this, and especially Aaron and uh, Kelly, you were both like, I, I am the CEO I, of everything. Uh, you're doing everything all the time. Um, I want to know, like, when you start to run a business, are you guys still? programming are you still podcast editing editing are you producing the videos are you producing the podcast like how much of this stuff can you like offload to other people because i find it takes up all night and then i work all day and i told my wife the other day i'm working two jobs and only getting paid for one and i'm getting tired <laughs> so what's that look like for you guys as as you've grown yeah. Uh, as you grow, uh, as money is coming in, you get the luxury of being able to spend some of that money and start delegating. So we don't do any any podcast or video editing. Shout out to our editor, Chris Enns. He is amazing. Um, he does our editing for both Ladybug and for Commerce T. Um, I still code. I try to avoid... Wow, I said that really sadly. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I do still code. Um, I am no longer the lead on any project because I need to be around to actually do the business development. I'm still very much a consultant. I'm, I'm usually leading more on the strategy side, but I help my team when they run into developer issues um, that they just need a second set of eyes to be solving something. Um, it's really important to, uh, there's the phrase work on your business, not in your business. Um, by It's the e-myth is the, what the book is called. Highly recommend reading that book if you're interested in becoming an entrepreneur. Um, I guess I should have done that as my secret next shout out, but not anymore. Um, but yeah, so it's just really important to, you, you can't do everything. And if you want to continue to grow, there's only so much time and so much you in the day. And yeah. so something starts to give. And it's really important to figure out what are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? And then figure out how to delegate the rest. Cool. Tyler, I know yours is a little, a little different because you're like coming up with that teaching side all the time. Yeah, it's it's really tricky. And I, uh, this is the first time I don't disagree with Kelly. We just have two different businesses. Yep. Um, for a service based business, that absolutely makes sense. For like a content uh, based business, it's a little bit tricky because outsourcing content is like a very scary game. Um, so we almost probably to a fault. Uh, we don't. I don't have any like. If you're doing content for us, you work full time for us, and there's like three of us and one person's not technical. Uh, so there's like really two like technical uh, content people, developers. Um, so yeah, we don't, I, I need to get better at outsourcing stuff that I um, can, but yeah, so far we do 
everything from like editing videos to writing content to doing SEO to um, yeah, all the newsletter like content is all just like in house. Do you have a person that does that specifically? Uh, all of us do everything is the oh, answer. Okay. Um, so when it comes to like bites, our weekly newsletters, um, Alex, who works with us, he's full time. Um, he writes like 70% Sounds of the cool. content. Yeah, I do the other 30%. Um, another Alex who works with us is kind of confusing. We have two Alexes and a Tyler, very generic white guys, but... Um, uh, the other Alex does a lot of like YouTube content and he's working on like a course platform and he does like courses for us. And I'm kind of just a glue that kind of fills in everything else. Um, so it is tricky, especially in like the content game. It's essentially a treadmill that you never get off of. And I think the sooner you embrace that, um, I don't know the happier you are, I guess, uh, or the sadder you are. I don't know. It could be either way. Um, yeah, that's how, that's how we work. So. Cool. Tyler, your your guys' content is so good. Here, Thank here's you. what I know based off what here based off what Kelly said. There's only one caveat I would add. Anytime you delegate, a little bit of the magic you bring to it, totally, it's lost a little bit, mm-hmm. and a little bit of the flair. You, at least in my experience, okay, um, I can tell you don't delegate anything because everything that you're putting out is so rad. I'm just like. Thank you. I know Tyler's involved in every step because the magic totally. hasn't hasn't dropped off at all. So yeah, and, and we haven't like I don't I don't know if there's a a way to do it. So we just haven't done it because like I'm not it's not worth risking that. And so like that's why like every Sunday I'm doing like bites content like our newsletter and like the rest of the week is spent doing other content because I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's it's a super hard problem and I haven't tried to solve it yet because I'm worried about screwing things up. So. Do you have a really good schedule management that you have your to-do list of stuff you work on at uh, certain times? I do, yeah. So I have two kids under three. I'm training for an Ironman and also doing the business thing. So it's like everything, like if I'm not doing one of those, if I'm not hanging out with family, working on the business or like running, biking or swimming, I'm probably sleeping. Um, I can't even imagine that. It's not, so I, I have to caveat this with like, this is what I really enjoy. And so it's not like, I don't recommend it for anybody else. Um I just happen to enjoy all three of those things a lot. So it works out for me. Cause like if I were to be doing something else, then I'm usually like itching to be doing one of those three things. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, really strict schedule, but it, uh, again, I really enjoy it. Um, yeah. I just, so I, I don't have a good answer for that. Cause it makes me sound a little bit more rigid than I want to come off, but like, that's the reality of it. Um, especially in like the content game that I am in. So. Yeah. You're, you're like me. My wife's always like, what are you going to do when you retire? I'm like this. This is all yeah, I've ever wanted exactly. to do. So why would I do anything yeah. else? <laughs> yep. It's a hobby. Uh, me, dude. I'm I'm buying a fishing boat down in Cancun <laughs> and I'm gonna be a fishing boat captain. That's 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 a fact. <laughs> I See, was this gonna is say, I'm gonna just be traveling so I can go on the fishing boat. <laughs> yeah, God and we can travel welcome. again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I just want to uh, thank you all so much for for taking the time. I know you're all super busy. The last part of our show that we love to do is called Perfect Picks. And today we're going to start with Allie. Allie's first pick is if I could click the right buttons fast enough. Oh, there I was going to shout out Ladybug because both Kelly and I are here and we talk about a lot of similar things on here. Uh, like this week, we talked about creating ebooks and all the process that goes into that. So thought it might be relevant for anybody. That was a fantastic podcast, by the way. I learned a lot on that. I'm waiting on that blog post for the Kindle publishing from Kelly. Oh, I need to do that. Okay. (laughs) Let me add that to my list. (laughs) You've stressed her out. This isn't good. Um, I totally jumped over Aaron in my alphabetical pool here. So we'll (laughs) come back to Aaron. It's okay. uh, We've got this. So, the COVID fatigue, the only thing that's got me through it is TikTok. No joke. Um, nothing else has gotten me through COVID fatigue more than TikTok. Anyway, uh, a lot of really good community leaders on TikTok. There's one called, her name is Goddess Mia. And so I just wanted to put her down as my perfect pick because she's a, she's an example for all of us to model after. She she has a an ideal level of in, of intolerance for intolerance and nice. i love that she doesn't tolerate other people's intolerance and she calls it out and she's a great example so she's a leader for me so i always wanted to share her account on tiktok goddess mia 20 very cool i saw a really good tiktok today 
if a you replace the word you and Kelly Clarkson's because of you with COVID, it all fits. <laughs> oh, no. So oh, go for that. Yeah. Well, now I know it's going to be stuck in my head all day. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Kelly, you are up next. So it can't be a live event without me recommending Atomic Habits by James Clear. This is my, this is the book that I read every single year um, on forming good habits and learning how to, you know, how to ease into it really. Um, a really, really great reminder, even if I read the book multiple times at this point. So highly, highly recommend adding this book to your to read list or to listen to list. Very cool. Love that. I have uh, read Atomic Objects, but not Atomic Habits. Oh, it's well, a now you one. have your next book. It's <laughs> a good one. Mr. McGinnis. Yeah, mine's a super boring one, but I try to keep it on theme with the uh, the show. Uh, so mine is I have a it's a it's a book financial intelligence. Uh, this is the revised edition, so a little bit more exciting. Basically, what it allows you to do is if you're wanting to start a business and you're wanting to make uh, business decisions based off your financials. This is like a perfect introduction. It'll teach you everything from like how to read an income statement to a PL statement to like COGS and EBITDA and all those different ratios that you should care about. Um, and so if you're uh, wanting to get a little bit more financially savvy as far as like running a business goes, uh, this is a perfect like one on one book for you. So very cool. Love it. Brittany. Yeah, I have Start Freelancing Today by one of our guests, Kelly Vaughn. It is an amazing book that takes you through each part of creating a freelancing business from scratch. And it'll take you all the way from starting out your business to how to deal with clients. And it was just a fantastic read and gave me a lot of insight into that world. There's Thank our shirt. You. And there's the shirt. Yep. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> What did you do to that thing? Um, it's more of what my dad did to it. So uh -huh. I, yeah, I I completely forgot it existed until one day he randomly just texted me a picture of a shirt missing a sleeve. And I was like, I know exactly what that is. And then he gave it to me and here I am holding the holding the shirt. It's funny. I didn't realize it was Hudson, Michigan. I have some relatives over there. Yeah. Cool. And, oh, and then my other pick is one. kind of with... Kelly stuff too. the Shopify blog. She works with Shopify and uh, they have a blog post on how to start a business, which also takes you through a lot of that. And I found a lot of details in there and they have a lot on the blog in general, but this specific post was really good. Breaking down some of the stuff that you need. Remember that number four that I keep telling you, I'm going to give uh, to you of my grand business plan. I think I just let everybody in on the secret. So we're probably screwed. <laughs> All right, uh, my picks are, if I can get over to it, we, we talked about it a little bit. Um, so Tyler, it sounds like you actually ran through this, but Stripe Atlas, um, awesome way to get a company started. The only hesitation, and maybe Tyler more, knows more than I do, um, I believe you'd need to set this up as a C Corp or you can switch to an S Corp. I don't think they do LLCs. I could be wrong on that. I've, I've, done, an, I've done an LLC with, uh, Stripe Atlas. It was great. It was like a did it like two months ago for my brother's like local business, and awesome. Um, it was good too. And they also have what's nice about specifically Stripe Atlas is they have a ton of documents. Oh, documents. Wow, they have a ton of like blog posts um, about everything that we talked about from like when you should do a C corp or an LLC and like the trade offs and Delaware and all of that stuff. So if you read through um, their docs, uh, super good for learning all that stuff as well. Very cool. And then my second pick um, is what I'm currently using is Inkfile. Uh, the jury's still out for me on this. I've been using them for years and I find I'm spending more and more and more money and everyone I talk to is like, why don't you just pay the 50 bucks a year? So I'm gonna have to uh, dig through that a little more and try to understand it. But I think we got some great advice today that I can take to heart. So. If you'd like to get started very simply, Inkfile is an uh, easy solution. I just wanted to say thank you so much, everyone. You all are way busier than um, uh, I could ever imagine. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I wish I could give you anything, but as you know, what we just talked about, I'm just getting started. So uh, really, really uh, glad you were able to make it today. And I hope you can make another one. Um, pick a topic. I'd love to talk about it. 
Thanks again. Thanks really appreciate us. all the feedback. Thank you, so Thank you. Yeah, nice meeting everyone. Nice meeting you.